hello everyone uh, welcome welcome to uh, sas engineering episode number i think 200 uh, we have uh, vaibhav today uh, who is a cto at uh, alma base he was an early engineer there and uh, now he heads all of engineering and he was at morgan stanley earlier he's he's going to be talking about uh, something which a lot of you might be interested in which is how to have big impact with a small engineering team and yeah five of please all yours thank you shiva for the introduction uh, so yeah uh, a little bit about me i joined alma base around uh, in 2016 i was the first engineer who joined alma base and today we have a team of five engineer uh, in alma base so let me just uh, share the screen and uh, Just a second. Okay. Perfect. Can you see my screen? Yeah. I. Yes. Yes. Perfect. So yeah. Uh, so today, while the topic says building SaaS apps, generating million plus revenue with five engineer, it's it's mostly about uh, how can we run small engineering team. Uh, and tie that uh, to revenue and mostly we will talk about a few things that kills productivity and we'll figure out uh, or how did alma base find some of the solutions to the problems that we faced over the last 4 5 years at different stages we faced different problem and different solution worked for us and i wanted to share that today uh, before we start a little bit about alma base we are a b2b saas uh, product headquartered in bangalore So basically, uh, we build tools for schools and universities, uh, especially in US, to help them raise funds from their alumni and then manage events or build online communities for students and alumni, right? And all of these is being facilitated with multiple products uh, that we provide to our customers, and that's 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 basically what uh, Alma Base does. We are around seven year old company, and we have forty uh, five. plus team members and hiring more uh, i think by by next 2 3 months we'll be around 50 plus team members so that's that's about alma base uh, a little logistic about this session maybe you can ask the q and uh, questions uh, in this in the chat box uh, somewhere i can't see them when i'm presenting but maybe once the once the slides are finished uh, we'll go to all the questions and then answer them and sometime it might happen that a uh, few slides later you get You might get a sense about, uh, uh, like you might get an answer to that question, and then uh, while we are talking, uh, let's let's keep in mind that uh, we're talking about what kills developers' productivity, and maybe you can also talk about what kills developer productivity at your uh, organizations, and then pop that up, add that into the chat box, uh, right? As as we go through the next twenty twenty five minutes, right? So yeah. Uh, what what we will talk about is something about alma base tech stack and how the product team we have structured and then some of the standard practices uh, in engineering how all of those has evolved from last 4 5 years when we went from one engineer to two engineers to four engineers to five engineers until today and how are they all been uh, changed as the revenue or as the company is growing right towards the end i wanted to share some of the observations uh, that i have found out in last 4 5 years and a few books that inspires uh, me or think about or pushes the boundary so uh, yeah that's that's the uh, just of what we will talk about right so uh, alma base team we have five engineers there are two back end engineer one front end engineer and then two full stack engineers and in product uh, we have two pms and one designer and uh, we've recently hired one qa engineer uh, for for mostly for manual testing and then i think as as we up our game with that we'll also build start working on building an automated test suits uh, so that's where the qa would play a role there so that's that's our mobile team tech stacks is uh, we use primarily django framework which is in python and then ant design system it's built on the top of like we we use react js uh, to build component one of the things that has helped choosing a design system over building our own component is the amount of time it saves for developers and designers to actually figure out okay uh, new components and new button a lot of components are already there in the design system 
uh, databases, we, we've used uh, RDBMS as a, like primary data sources, MySQL. And then we use for some of our application, use MongoDB, Elasticsearch. Uh, we are on uh, Bitbucket. Uh, it's an Atlassian pro product. All of our Git repos is hosted on Bitbucket. We use Asana for task management. Uh, and then Notion for basically asking discussions or even when we have to come to a dis uh, decision, all of that is being documented on Notion. So that's that's how we operate. Uh, uh, like uh, an engineering team. So yeah, uh, for that now I'll take you through some of the problems that we have faced and how did we solve that at some juncture, uh, like at, at different phases of the company, right? So the first problem was how much is too much to spend on infra, right? So Almabase uh, has been a bootstrapped company. Uh, initially we raised fund, some fund from angel investor, but from last four or five years, we have not raised any money. We've been uh, profitable since then. Right. So this question is how much is too much on infra is was an important one. Right. Another place where we've been asking the question is, do we just scale it vertically or do we need to actually design the system to actually scale horizontally as we add more machine and then it gets uh, scaled. And then uh, sometimes is it like, should we just over provision it and then don't worry about setting up all the system for auto scaling. And another important question that we come is, uh, should we build it or just buy it? Right. How do we take decision on what is there are many factors, but uh, some of the boundaries that helped us to arrive at a decision. Another problem that we were facing initially is SSDs were very, very costly, especially premium SSDs. And when we had a self managed database on a VM, it was taking a lot of time for engineers and costing a lot of money when it comes to like, let's say if you have increased the disk size or you just attach a large disk, a premium SSD, which will just turn out money to save engineering time. And then the whole master slave setup, data recovery would need expertise and a lot of time uh, to set up, maintain, and even if you have to recover or promote a replica to a master. So then uh, uh, we had only one engineer in the team, right? Who knows everything and everyone would say, hey, you know what, uh, this is just five minutes, can you do this, right? So it's, it's all one engineer knows uh, everything about infrastructure or how the data, how the systems are inter interconnected. And that also resulted into there was no documentation specifically for infrastructure, how it works and all of that. So there was no scope for improving it, extending it or debugging it. It just all depends on that one engineer. Uh, so that these are all the problems uh, that we were facing. And uh, some of the things that we've tried it, uh, like these three sections, costing. What did we do with costing is we'd, we've tried to draw on a boundary. Like, so we'll spend three to 5% max of our revenue ARR on infrastructure that constitute to all the cloud resources. We are primarily on Azure and we have some workload on AWS, but that's one and all the alerts and monitoring tool, the SaaS product that we bought. So we've been able to uh, draw this boundary and then every time we just take a 3% of current ARR and 5% and all of our decisions that, okay, you know what, uh, we can just increase the machine. It's still less than 5% of the ARR. We don't need to worry about uh, horizontal scaling. So that's, those are the, some of the pointers that would help us to take those decisions. And then uh, another boundary that we've drawn is four to six percent of ARR on other SaaS tools, like SendGrid uh, for sending emails, also for authentication, Twilio, and any other infrastructure as a service that we would buy. It was helping us to figure out, okay, this pricing works for us. Hey, this pricing doesn't work for us. We need to build an in-house tool for now. Right, like whether it's push notification and all of that. So these boundaries helped us to control the costing and answer the question that do we need to build something like horizontally scalable or we can, we are, it's okay to vertically scale it for now, right? Uh, and as the ARR increases, you also get like this three and 5% also increases, right? So we were able to still sustain that growth. When it comes to DB maintenance, uh, we've moved all of our, like most of our databases to manage services and then started using backups provided by a cloud provider in enormous amount of time got freed up from the engineer plus uh, anyone could do it like you just go and read the documentation so we don't need a specialized person who knows uh, db database admin or something like that so this has helped us uh, reducing the amount of effort we used to put in and then the last part was documentation so We've moved to uh, Terraform, which is basically a tool for infrastructure as uh, code. So we've started provisioning all of our cloud resources, right? And uh, started setting up all of the networking using Terraform. 
right so that has like instead of maintaining a documentation or how infrastructure work or diagram i think terraform give that visibility so uh with infrastructure as code uh like documentation was taken care and also uh one good thing was when we were pushing it we could actually see what all infrastructure changes would be made right so it was it helped us in that direction and since then i think all of the infrastructure changes were very quick and easy uh for anyone in the team uh to understand because anyone can go to terraform and then uh just go through the documentation to learn how how to use terraform and we uh, using ansible to configure our vms right we are we have not uh, dockerized our production environment we are still running on vms but yeah ansible helps us to configure all of those vms so all of these three steps had helped us to actually uh control our expenses on infrastructure save a lot of time on maintaining databases and also uh, infrastructure changes became easy and then it was democratized like any engineer could do it as per the project and we are not relying on one engineer to just do it so yeah, that's uh, that's how we solved this one moving to the next problem was uh, deployment right and it was always like that that when you have to deploy you need to refer a document with a list of command to execute which was still better than remembering the commands and then we had a rule that let's not deploy it on friday let's not deploy it on 7 pm in the evening let's not deploy a day prior to holiday or even your birthday or even let's not deploy a day prior to the only engineer who knows how infra works and then apart from that what happened what used to happen was we used to check with other developer hey are you available just in case like just double check just in case if something goes wrong just be on standby right and then uh, and and one more thing that we started noticing was a lot of unrelated changes were clubbed together so instead of like one pr is merged and then go to production you will have like three four pr you will wait and then merge all of them together and let's now go to production because it takes time and then you have to coordinate with other developer and all of this is not automated so all of these problems were again uh, this, the code was just sitting in code repos or it was it needed more developers to actually coordinate right so we wanted to remove this constraint so that developer can move faster the code can move faster to production and developers are not blocked uh, so that turned into we've uh, implemented ci cd in that so specifically we did two things one is automated code deployment to staging and production so what has happened by doing that is uh, we are now deploying multiple times a week right there is no clubbing of changes anything that, even small changes are going into production so the risk that it goes down is less another thing that we did is is reverting production to a working state quickly without worrying about okay should i revert the code and then build a new create a new build and publish all of that all of these processes we divided are designed in such a way that it's fine for git because it's very very rare that uh, 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 this incident happened but whenever it happened we would quickly get to a working stage of production fix that and then uh, deploy it again but yeah uh, like still we avoid deploying it on friday right we're working on that uh, aspect of it but i think uh, automated code deployment the whole ci in whatever fashion whatever language you've been using it i think there are too many like uh, we had a very good session last week around how do we set up ci cd all of that could be used to actually automate and then it addresses a lot of problems when it comes to developer productivity right and then the second thing that we did is uh, with uh, automated infra deployments so since we had infrastructure as code uh, we have also created a pipeline when it comes to okay uh, this is an infra change. You create a PR. Someone would just review it, and then before deploying, it actually it shows an actual difference between the infrastructure and the new infrastructure. And there are plugin that actually shows you increase in the cost as well, right? And all of this is automated, so no one needs to know I have to do this and that. Once the PR is reviewed, you merge it, and the infrastructure uh, infra changes are made in the production environment, right? So these has given more confidence to our developers. Then there is no blocking that you need to have other developer who is on standby if things goes wrong. The downtime has reduced drastically because of mistakes, right? And all of this has again given more time for the developers to actually code better software. So yeah, that that's how we solve this second problem. Uh, moving on to the next problem was this expression, right? Uh, who should be on call? And it was like, okay, not me, man. 
right and then uh, and then when you ask is is like who is on call basically it was everyone was on call right there was no no uh, no one person okay he is on call or she is on call so this this was an expression uh, uh for some time uh while we were growing so like we, we it, it was like we were all on call we are on call right so what used to happen was there were team members from sales uh, csm support executive operation mostly all the team members who are directly working with prospects or customer would reach out to individual engineer hey you know what i have this issue this is an issue this customer is saying this hey we need this can you explain me this can we do this all that sort of questions were coming to engineers and with async it was even harder because the engineers would see the message at different time right if a doesn't see the re- doesn't reply immediately they will message b b doesn't reply c and then all of them would end up working on the same problem later to realize okay someone else is also working and then there was an engineer who would fix everything and every time so you will always know okay uh, this is an engineer who would take care of it right so all of this was resulting into so much of con- like context switching for the engineers then it was frustration that was leading to really poor software design because what whatever they were designing they will be like okay you are always constantly distracted with these messages from different people so you'll be like okay let's like you you don't get time to refine or fine tune your design then uh, it was also resulted into superficial testing by developers okay this works uh, let's go in and then the production releases were always out of line right they were always delayed by few days sometimes a week and we also noticed that were fixes were directly pushed to production because again it was a quick bug fix without understanding or thinking through the repercussions okay this we have to quickly fix it because there is some demo somewhere it would i ideally fix it uh, do a superficial testing and go to production so these were the problem we were facing uh, and then that's where we realized that every engineer in alma base is on call and that's that's the happy realization is uh, without a process everyone is on call and that that hit us hard right and that's where uh, we've started working on okay let's define a process so that that we are on call change to i am on call so at different stages two approaches worked for alma base the approach one which was really good one which worked initially when we had like three engineers uh, uh, is we used to call we used to appoint a happiness engineer so one engineer on a rotation for a week so every week an engineer would change and they are responsible for actually so there would be a common slack channel anyone who has an issue the happiness engineer would go and communicate so the other engineers would know where uh, he is an or she is an happiness engineer so she will take care of uh, all the communication and even if the bug fixes uh, the engineer would try it and if there is any issue they will coordinate internally and that worked well for for a uh, year year and a half but then what happens is team size started increasing and everything was urgent because now you have more people in more csms more sales person and 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 then what happened was the happiness engineer had a backlog then that would go to the next happiness engineer and that would go to the next happiness engineer so then we started doing a product management in happiness engineer and it was too much of work right and that's where we realized okay this pro, with this increase in team we can't just lot one resource because we were like three engineers 30% is gone in managing bug fixes and urgent request then we move to a more standard process for on call where uh, we started with approach 2 so there we had uh, pager duty to configure schedule and integrated with our alerts monitoring system so anything goes goes down the developer would get a call and then we had two slack channels something like a warning and a critical so warning would keep uh, showing that something might go wrong so if developers is there uh, they might go check warning or if it's critical it will create an incident on pager duty and so we have established all of this process but one thing like uh, uh which worked really well for us is to educate the whole team around what is critical that you have to wake up an engineer at 3 am in the morning and what is urgent right and then establishing this that hey urgent things can wait for the next day was hard and a painful process but i think over time it took us around 2 to 3 months to get on board with every team we worked with every team to figure out hey you know what uh we created a list of all the issues and then classified as it was a critical and urgent could it wait or not so it took some time for us to educate the team but now we are at a place where everyone in the team understand what is critical what is urgent and urgent things can wait for the next day so that the engineers are available in the office uh right uh and another thing that worked for us was pager duty we are, our schedule is from sunday to saturday 
so none of the engineer has to actually spend both the days consecutive days of weekend uh, so that is also relaxing uh, for engineers and it's also helped them to plan so if if you planning for a phd duty or an on call change instead of monday to sunday have it a saturday to or sorry a sunday to saturday schedule right it gives a relaxing one day uh, for any engineer to take off all of their uh, like this uh, the work stress and then have a relaxing day at least one even if they are on on call so that's that's these are things that uh, work for us over time um so the next problem came in is um, yeah we were on call but now it was like if some issue happens it was a painful process to figure out okay where is that issue or what is that causing and most of the common issue was they the site is slow or sometimes it's slow sometimes it works right that's that's where we started with and then the engineer would look into nginx log which is access log error logs and application logs at some part or uh, one second i'll just do a check if yes sorry i'm just checking if i'm only one speaking cool so yeah um yeah when it comes to application log at some time we had it on machines but when when there were multiple machines we streamed it to cloud watch but then a developer would go through database logs and then you download and since we were using managed services you have to download it from the ui do a grep set all of that to figure out uh, what makes sense right and then database logs might not have give queries if it's configured in that way and the second biggest problem was date time format it was different in all the log files so going through all of this was again time taking process then we could not uh, correlate all the nginx logs or load balancer logs with app logs and then uh, there were times when some of the queries or some requests would actually slow down or bring down the production and then we don't know which one uh, without going through all the logs uh, and then uh, and then this was his annoying request that okay platform randomly slows down or it throws error and then it gets back and by the time it's back when the engineer goes in they were like okay everything is working fine right so we were struggling with these problem so what we did is uh, we brought in observability here and the first thing that we set up is apm uh, application performance management for uh, only for our app servers that we started using data log what it does is uh, all of this data is streamed directly to apm and then you can uh, not so uh, data log is a really good integration with django so it also shows the function what queries how many time it was run which query is giving slow which query is fast so the amount of time to get to okay what exactly is causing slowness is it basically the database is it application is it an io we were within few minutes we were able to drill it down right so i think that has helped the apm amount of time it takes to debug has reduced drastically the moment we got apm another thing that we did is we had started adding request id to every request so that all the logs can be correlated and the thing is we have started streaming all of them to data doc so the date time issue is also gone so now we get a nice date picker so you say date and time picker and you like you quickly pick the time and then there are facets where it can help you to uh, trim uh, or drill down the issues very quickly so just by those features provided by this apm uh, tools or sas tools sas monitoring tools reduce the hours and hours of debugging time for our developers we still have sometimes we'll have one or two issues that takes more time it cannot be solved with apm but i think almost 80 85% of our issues were addressed or quickly found out uh, using an apm solution so yeah that's uh, that's what that's how apm or this observability principle helped us we still uh, don't have monitoring for all the database and all of the servers because apm at least for data dog that the experience that i have is it's able to get all of those traces uh, from application uh, and show us the details what what's wrong with any of the connected system that we use right so that's that's about observability the next problem came in once we fixed all infrastructure and uh, on call and debugging is uh, basically back end developers would develop the api fast and then the front end developer would use the api and then start working on it that was like a normal practice that we were using we were doing it and then back end developer would nicely move to the new project 
But what happens is later we realize or front end developer would say, hey, you know what, I need few more APIs, two more APIs, or, or uh, you would need to change the structure of an API. So that's where backend developer would struggle with, okay, I have to do new um, project and also old project, maybe you have to make changes, make changes to this API and you build new APIs. And usually what happens is backend developer would say, okay, I have to do it, but I'll wait for all those requests and I'll do it at one time. And the front end developer is blocked and waiting on backend because without them, the front end developer can't move to the next part of the problem. So there was a lot of back and forth, lot of waiting for back end developer and lot of waiting for front end developer to be precise, which was wasting a lot of developers' time and plus productivity cost that both back end and front end developer were paying there. So uh, we've tried to solve this problem is where. Um, we are uh, here instead of a product, we got in a process where we started using Postman and we've now uh, started saying that we are an API first company. So even we start writing code, uh, front end and back end developer will sit down for the first two, three days and write all the API in open API to a, a swagger to or open API to format. It's an easy format uh, to begin with. So it was, uh, that's what they used to do. And then what happens is we also started something called as UI UX design review. Right, where the front end developer and the designer would actually sit down and figure out. So front end developer would go through every design and then check if all the APIs are available or not. Right. So all these three people, front end, back end, and designer, sometimes the same role, like the same role is being played by multiple people, but these three functions would sit down and have these two outcomes where the API design is finalized and reviewed by front end guy and the UI uh, is also reviewed by front-end. So here, our front-end team played a vital role to collaborate with back-end. And then after two, three days, both front-end and back-end developer would parallelly start working. So front-end would just mock those APIs. Most of the time it's possible and sometimes it's hard, but in general, they would just mock the APIs and they would build the integration and back-end would design the API. Towards the end, it'll take another two, three days just to integrate, uh, change the base URL, uh, integrated fix few big bugs and we are done so a huge amount of time like with that the good thing is we were started hitting our timelines we were we started delivering project on timeline right and once the backend moved to the next project there was no going back then we had an api design or documentation as well already with us so uh yeah that's that's how we were able to actually uh solve like save a lot of Time and give more time to developers to code. Uh, so yeah, that's one problem, and that's how we've solved it over time. So the next problem uh, came is once we've uh, solved the uh, product building within our uh, company. Another problem came in with integrations mostly, right? And uh, specifically, uh, some of the data that we have is nested data, and then in that, uh, when we have nested data, the integration was super tricky because you have to loop through it. Then there are for loops, there were while loops, conditions, all of them were getting very, very tricky to build. And then uh, there was this assumption, right? If you build it for one customer, other customer can use. So we have started building whatever the enhancement, let's just build it generically so that any customer, because we were like a multi-team and B2B SaaS product, other customer can also use the same feature. And most of the time, what we've realized is you might have one or two customer, but you never know uh, we will ever reuse it. Then, uh, so the generic or native integration was working only for common use cases because the schools or university that we work with had a very different process of using the same tool. So they use the same tool that we integrate with in a very, very different way. Only common uh, use cases were being served. And every time there is a new request, it was like this. If you built it for one customer, other would use it. And that would take time. And then uh, sometimes we would used to just give them, hey, this is Alma base API, why don't you just build the integration? But most of our customers initially uh, were not enterprises. Or so. They didn't have IT developers or developers in there. They were like, okay, we don't have developers. Um, so that was one thing. And then there was constant context switch with engineers who knows about the product, right? They would be asked by sales team or CSMs. It was like, hey, why don't you come and join this call and understand if we can do it or we need to build an integration. So a lot of time, for the developers was going into uh, building customization for one customer, but generic enough for everyone to use or joining calls with sales or CSMs or collaborating with them around what we can build, what we can't build. Right? And we wanted to again uh, 
uh, we looked at it and then we figured out what can what can we improve in here right so we've tried three approaches or we are doing these three approaches for enterprise customers who already have uh, um, teams support the uh, developers right or it team we are providing them api alma base api that we have anyway documented we have a nice product for documentation it takes that open api and then build a really good documentation and then we started building also web hooks at different triggers uh, right so it it was easy for them to actually build real time applications that sync up with their crms etc then for those customer who do not have developer team we started we built a microsoft power automate connector which is basically uh, it's it's an alternative or a, a competitor to say peer uh, which is a no code or a very codeless uh, automation platform right that again works on the top of our apis and web hooks so we either tell them hey you know uh, we have a connector just build your flow or sometimes we help them to build the flow uh, based on their specific use cases and the last one is we actually uh, started a team where we can act build custom integrations using third party apis alma base apis and web hooks for enterprise customer so all of these problem is basically owned by a solution engineer um, so the job of uh, the engineer is to basically unblock business with less efforts from the product engineers all of those engineers were actually building alma base apis right so they can still focus on the core product offerings while the solution engineer would go in and use our apis web hooks and then start suggesting or guiding customers on how do we build uh, integrations all of the support right and also very good feedback to our product engineer around how we should model our apis that can be again used by our customers so this has been working well and interestingly the second approach where we are building a connector has been picked up really well so every customer that we are talking about now we are pushing them to build a microsoft power automate workflow right and they have been adopting that so that's that's a insight that we have recently and this we started doing it from last 8 9 months right so a few observation this is uh, the last last bit uh, right few observation uh, that i had in, in in this years was uh avoid one engineer who is working on backend and frontend we'll have full stack engineer but either they should work on backend or frontend that's what we try to do because that would result it into a very tightly coupled product and then it's buggy because uh one developer with tight timeline they have to finish backend frontend deploy all of that coordinate the with product managers and we have also observed that there was bad architecture because it was like okay it's easy for front end i'll just add this key right so over time it compounds so we've tried to avoid uh, even having full stack working on the same project for both back end and front end then uh, we've recently hired a qa for manual testing basically when it comes to small teams with again tight timelines it was getting difficult to test each and every corner case and sometimes there were misses so again uh, adding a qa helps with uh, that even if few things are overlooked then they can be fixed and then again you get more velocity when you are developing right another thing is when when there are integration problem it's not always that we have to build a native integrations or uh, have engineers or back end front end developer engineers sitting down with customer there 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 are something like solution engineers and implementation engineers who actually works with the apis that your product provides and the third party apis and build integration and there are too many no code platform nowadays where we can leverage or build connectors so that again saves a lot of time from uh, engineers who are building product right and then another observation is when there are too many things for the developers or engineers to do like so many things that if, like there are multiple events right uh, it, it is is sometimes it we tends to get okay let me get one more developer so that things would happen but uh, also look think about do you actually need a product manager who would prioritize it uh, so that we have p1 p2 p3 right given the number of uh, engineers we have or maybe a designer to free up some time for product manager sometimes the product manager are overloaded with so many projects so in the end i would just say uh, net net the crux of this is avoid uh, asking engineer to work on functions that can be done by non engineers and i think that is going to save a lot of time for engineers enhance their productivity plus you would actually run a performant engineering team a very lean team without compromising on the quality of products and 
till you can go to millions of dollars when it comes to revenue specifically in b2b saas so that's about it uh, the last slide is uh, some of the books that have uh, helped me uh, and also some of the books that are recommended my team is shape up it's a uh, that's how we do our sprint cycles right so it's by base camp it's a very nice read a small booklet you can just google it there and then another book which is an interesting one is an elegant puzzle system of uh, engineering this is specifically for engineering leaders who are running engineering team or who are figuring out okay hi should i uh, when do i pay a technical debt when do i hire when do i give a slack to the team how do we innovate all of these are very nicely structured and gives a good perspective around thinking about those problem another book is architecture patterns with python this is specifically for any uh, architecture any architect in the team or back end developers uh, irrespective of programming language like it's it's for python but the content is super good it's just that the examples are in python but the architecture pattern is actually common uh, for any programming language that you pick another interesting read is escaping the build trap this is for product manager how do you think about uh, building like if there are too many priorities right build build with feature versus feature versus feature versus feature if you are going through that without having impact on the bottom of the funnel it's a good read uh, and then last but not the least is domain driven design uh, specifically for developers who are struggling with writing uh, business logic writing in the sense where do i add my business logic is it a service layer is it what layer all of that it's a very good read around understanding some of the architectures uh, around building an enterprise b2b saas product uh, so yeah that's uh, about me you can reach out to me at uh, vaibhav@anabase.com or just search vaibhav chat on linkedin happy to connect but uh, yeah that's that's about me maybe we can open for questions i will stop re recording yeah